Under constitutional amendments on second reading, we have Senate Joint Resolution Constitutional Amendment Number One. Mr. Clerk. Senate Joint Resolution Constitu Constitutional Amendment Number One was read in full a second time on a previous day. Third reading. Mr. Clerk, Senate Joint Resolution Constitutional Amendment Number One, please read the full constitutional amendment. Senate Joint Resolution Constitutional Amendment Number One, resolved by the Senate of the 101st Ge General Assembly of the State of Illinois, that House Representatives carrying, carrying herein, that there shall be submitted to the electors of the state for adoption or rejection that general election next occurring at least six months after the adoption of this resolution, a proposition to amend Section 3 of Article 9 of the Illinois Constitution as follows. Article 9, Revenue. Section 3, Limitations on Income Taxation. Subsection A, the General Assembly shall provide by law for the rate or rates of any tax on or measured by income imposed by the state. In any such tax imposed upon corporations, the highest rate shall not exceed the highest rate imposed on individuals by more than a, a ratio of 8 to 5. Subsection B, laws imposing taxes on or measured by income may adopt by reference provisions of the laws and regulations of the United States as they then exist or thereafter may be changed for the purpose of arriving at the amount of income upon which the tax is imposed. Schedule this mis Constitutional Amendment takes effect upon being declared adopted in accordance with Section 7 of the Illinois Constitutional Amendment Act. This was first reading in full, uh, correction, third reading in full of Senate Joint Resolution Constitutional Amendment Number 1. Representative Martwick. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Ladies and gentlemen of the House, today I present for your consideration Senate Joint Resolution Constitutional Amendment Number 1. Upon passage, this resolution will cause a referendum question to appear on the ballot in the November 2020 election. And it will allow the citizens of the state of Illinois, through the course of that election, to weigh in to decide whether or not Illinois would have the ability to adopt a fair tax. Now we all run on the ideas of reform. We all come here to make things better. But what is reform if reform is not identifying problems and finding solutions to those problems? Solving them. All of Illinois' problems, every problem that we have in the state, can be traced back to our inability to manage our finances. Over the course of decades, our government has run structural deficits year after year after year, leading to a massive accumulation of debts, debts in our pension system, debts in our backlog of bills, and deferred maintenance in our infrastructure. About 15 years ago, that debt service exploded, and it started to cause massive pressures on our budgets. And what did we do? We started making cuts. We made massive cuts to education to a point where more than 80% of the children that attend schools in Illinois don't have the adequate resources to provide them with a minimally sufficient education. Some districts decided that that wasn't good enough and so they began raising their property taxes and have led us to have one of the highest property taxes in the country. Other districts who couldn't afford to raise their property taxes basically left their children to be cast aside without the adequate resources to receive a quality education. We cut funding for higher education in half over the course of the last decade, leading to the biggest tuition increases in the country and the largest decline in enrollment of our college students. We led, led, this, led to heartless cuts to our social services, mental health, addiction counseling, homeless prevention programs for children. And how about seniors? We made massive cuts to Meals on Wheels and in-home care, forcing thousands of seniors into nursing homes, and then we cut reimbursement rates, causing nursing homes to close. Finally, we made across-the-board cuts to state agencies year after year after year, cutting the budgets of our state agencies to the point that we have the lowest number of state employees per capita in the country. Now, most of our government agencies are so understaffed that they can't even accomplish their core mission. 
Some of these are just plain stupid, like IDNR. The Illinois Department of Natural Resources has lost 1,400 people over, through cuts over the course of the last decade, leading to a point where they have cut so many people that they don't have anyone to fill out grant applications, and we lose out on millions of dollars a year, millions of dollars a year in federal grants to maintain our, our state parks and our state properties. Imagine that. How stupid is that? And some of them are just unconscionable. We've made year over year to cuts to, to budgets like DCFS, and now you have children dying because you have caseworkers that are overburdened and underpaid. And so what are the solutions to these problems? The solutions are to eliminate our deficits. Eliminate that structural deficit. And when you do that, you start to right the ship. You can fund education. You can pay down debts. How do you do that? Well, there's only two choices. You can raise the flat tax, or you can adopt a fair tax. Now, COGFA did a study for me, and many of you are aware of this, that said in order to balance our budgets between now and 2045, we'd need a 6.5% flat tax. Raise the 4.95 to 6.5. But there's an important point that they said. They said every moment that we delay in instituting that flat tax of 6.5% is going to lead to higher and higher and higher taxes because we will accumulate debt and more debt and more debt. And so without any movement, we're on our way to a seven, seven and a half, eight percent flat tax. But in Illinois, we have a very unfair tax system. According to the Institute on Tax and Economic Policy, we have the eighth most unfair, eighth most regressive tax system in the country, meaning more than 42 other states. We put too much of the burden of funding our government on the backs of the people who can least afford to pay it, middle class, working class, and poor. They're overburdened, and they need some relief. The fair tax? If approved by the voters, if they choose this tax reform, this path forward for Illinois, we will be in a position where we can eliminate those deficits. And when we eliminate those deficits, we stop accumulating debts, and we begin to pay them down. And when we pay down those debts, we relieve the pressure for future tax increases. When we live up to our commitment to fund education and schools start to be funded properly, we provide the education that so many children in the state are not getting, and we begin to relieve the burden on high property taxes. This is reform. This is what we all come here to do. Identify problems, find solutions. This is the solution for Illinois going forward. I'd be happy to answer any questions, and I ask for an I vote. Members, there are many people seeking recognition on this very important piece of legislation. Everyone will be recognized and will be allowed to speak for five minutes. We will institute a five-minute timer Please respect the timer, respect the chamber, and respect the other members over the course of the debate. Everyone seeking recognition will be recognized. First up, we have Representative Batnick. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I request an immediate verification should the bill get the requ required number of votes, and will the sponsor yield? Representative Batnick, your, re your request for verification is noted, and the sponsor indicates that he will yield. Uh, Representative, uh, I was actually surprised at how much uh, you put in there that I agreed with, but there certainly are some important distinctions. I, th I think you're going to have to clarify something for me. So you said this is a constitutional amendment about reforms. Uh, my my uh, analysis does not say that this is fair maps or term limits. Am I correct in that? You consider this a reform? Yes, this is a reform. It reforms. It, it provides an opportunity for Illinois to reform the manner in which it collects taxes. Okay. Um, you also said that we have an inability to manage our finances. I certainly agree with that and, and we'll address that in a little bit. Uh, one of the things that confuses me though, in terms of an inability to manage our finances and continuing to increase taxes, we have one of the overall highest, we've seen study after study, we are not a low tax state. So we live in a state that pays overall high taxes 
yet you're trying to increase the amount of revenue coming into the Illinois Department of Revenue. And in, in terms of inability to manage our finances, it sounds like we're squandering our finances. A um, couple of questions for you here. So we've had a lot of new money, new revenues, things opened up that are in, the, in this year's budget that actually, in total, almost match what you're trying to get at with, with the fair tax. I want to list off some of them. The uh, spending reduction for the MCO assessment, that's about a billion dollars, correct? I don't know the specifics of it, so I, I cannot confirm that. But. Okay. Um, 845 in revenue rev revisions from the strong economy, correct? For the, for the, my understanding is yes, that for the year 2020 for that budget, there is an additional 845 million, I think is what you said. That number sounds correct to me, and that of course was immediately put towards pensions because as you know, that was the amount that the governor had attempted to reduce the pension, uh, okay, had we'll get proposed to in, in, in a pension restructuring. And so that covers that whole, so we don't have to do that restructuring. All right, 368 million from online sales tax parity, 350 million possibly from uh, Casino VGT, 212 from sports betting, 175 million in delinquent tax plan, 170 million from cannabis, 94 million dollars from decoupling uh, from the federal repatriation, and 65 million in, in, in possible in cigarette taxes. The point is, you want to raise, you came into the session wanting to raise about 3.2 billion, and essentially that's what's being opened up, and that's not enough. Well, Representative, forgive me, but did you just count revenues from measures that have not been passed revenues like from measures like sports gaming and the bulk the bulk of the bulk of what i have in here is is passed or or is likely to pass either way my guess is you're, you're going to continue on the path you're down whether whether they pass or not i'm on a little bit of a timer i want to go to the bill ladies and gentlemen this body the democrats of illinois have an insatiable appetite for spending it will never be satisfied. It will never be enough. The five years, I thought I was going to say the one year I've been here, the five years I've been here, I have seen a parade, a parade of anti-growth bills. And these anti-growth bills don't just make it more expensive for businesses to do business in this state. It also makes it more expensive to run government. I've said it before on the floor. I'm going to say it again. He had mentioned higher education. We rank third in the funding of higher education, yet we still charge some of the highest tuitions in the nation. That is because, as the representative said, we have an inability to manage our finances. There's a lot of people that make a lot of money and are in debt because they have an inability to manage our finances. The issue isn't more taxes. The Democrats' plan is to tax more of a shrinking pie. The Republicans want to grow that pie. Yet we continue to see bill after bill that's going to continue to shrink that pie. And to the actual plan, one of our biggest issues is pensions. I did a video on this. I'm happy to share it with everybody. I'm sure somebody has seen it. The governor's plan under this is to add an extra $200 million to pensions after shorting it for a long period of time. We have $135 billion unfunded pension liability. $200 million sounds like a lot. When you take off the zeros, that is like adding $20 to, uh, to a $13,500 credit card bill per year or adding an extra dollar $1.67 a month. If anybody's had $13,000 on a credit card bill and thinks that adding $1.67 a month towards that bill is going to pay it off, you realize that's not going to happen. It's our appetite for spending. This isn't about fixing our biggest problems, with, which is pensions. We haven't addressed pensions locally with, with, with consolidation. I strongly urge a no vote. Thank you. Chair recognizes Representative McSweeney. Mr. Speaker, uh, to the amendment. Uh, we live in the best state in the country. We have the best people, uh, we have the greatest uh, natural resources, and we do have a world-class city in uh, Chicago. The problem we have in this state is that we are losing people because of our high level of taxation. And when we think about uh, taxation, you need to include not only the high property taxes, the second highest in the country, the high sales taxes, but the high income tax already at 4.95%, which obviously would go up uh, dramatically here. And we all know uh, that the real plan in the future uh, is to tax the middle class. There's no doubt about it. That's where the money is. 
Uh, that's why we're not voting on a plan for rates uh, first. This plan will be changed multiple times, and they will go to the middle class where the money is in this state. We should be talking about pension reform. We should be talking about Medicaid reform. We should talk, be talking about uh, cutting spending. But instead, what this is is a massive tax hike that starts off at $3.4 billion in order to sell that to the voters, but we all know that the ultimate number will be $10 to $11 billion based on the spending promises of this governor. So this is more of the same, taxes, taxes, and more taxes for people who are leaving the state. We're now behind Pennsylvania in population. We're going to lose one to two congressional seats. And the testimony that we heard in Revenue Committee the other day, people claiming that people uh, in the state are fine with taxes and are not leaving, is absolutely outrageous. We have an opportunity today to defeat this constitutional amendment, uh, if uh, four uh, brave members on the other side will stand up and vote no, and we could do the real business of the people, which is focus on reforming uh, this state, reforming pensions, reforming Medicaid, and actually making real changes. This bill, it will kill jobs, drive more people out of this state, and the reason it's going to kill jobs is it's going to hit the pass-through entities. Ninety percent of the businesses are pass-through entities that pay the individual tax rate. They're creating 72 percent of the jobs in this state, and they are going to be hit hard. We are going to lose jobs. We are going to lose people. What we need to do is focus on standing up for the taxpayers of the state, and we need to defeat this. I urge a no vote. Thank you very much. Chair recognizes Representative Dimmer. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. To the constitutional amendment, you know, each year in this chamber, uh, we have legislators who propose a series of bills that make significant increases in the spending that the state would incur in that year. Every year, there are hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars of proposed legislation that would add to the already challenging fiscal situation that the state finds itself in. And every year, those bills are given a reality check when we say we're not in a position to add billions and billions and billions of dollars in spending because we need to make good on the commitments that we've already made before we make new promises. And while we're looking at those bills, I think it's easy to say, boy, it'd be great if there was free money out there. It'd be great if we could wave a magic wand and we'd have every dollar that we need to be able to pay for services. But that's not reality. I think that's why this amendment's been offered. Because people can portray it like it's magic money, like it's free, like it comes from some pot of money that's not being used on anything else, and we can take it from the state, and we can figure out how to spend more and more each year. That's why there aren't any rates in this proposal. This proposal opens the door to say each year, we can figure out how many of these new spending initiatives will pass, and then we'll just adjust the rates accordingly to take that money from taxpayers and put it towards any new idea that this General Assembly comes up with. But that's not reality. The reality is that for every dollar this government takes in, it's a dollar that comes out of the pocket of a taxpayer in Illinois. Every dollar that we take to this government has an impact because it's a dollar that can't be spent by a family or a business in Illinois. We're saying give your money to us and let the state decide how to spend it. Let me ask you though, has the state earned that right? Have we shown f fiscal discipline? Have we been demonstrating a track record of success to taxpayers that they could have confidence that we would show restraint, that we wouldn't make promises that we can't afford to keep, that we wouldn't push bills off into future years or let unfunded liabilities rack up for decades? We haven't earned that trust from taxpayers. Before we look at an initiative like this and say, wouldn't it be great if all this extra money came in and spending didn't have any limitations, Let's remind ourselves that we live already in a state with the highest tax burden, that we haven't demonstrated fiscal responsibility in this chamber, and that we have no right to go back to taxpayers and ask for a blank check to fund any and all ideas that come before us in future years. Imagine us in 10 years down the line, if this amendment passes, imagine us 10 years down the line. What's more likely to have happened? that the initial rates offered that in themselves would be a $3.4 billion tax increase? Is it more likely that those rates stay in effect? Or is it more likely that over those 10 years, people make a change to a rate here, the rate goes up by a tenth of a point here, and the income bracket drops down there, and suddenly more and more Illinois families find themselves on the receiving end of a tax increase? 
We all know that's a more likely scenario. Don't listen to the TV ads that'll run for the next couple of months saying that, oh, it's, don't worry, somebody else will pay for it. You get all the benefits without any of the costs. We have to bear those costs. Illinois taxpayers have to bear those costs. And for that reason, we should have a lot of no's on the board. Thank you. Chair recognizes Representative Spain. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Will the sponsor yield? Sponsor indicates that he will yield. Uh, Representative Martwick, um, could you uh, inform me what is the deadline for passage of amendments to the state constitution? Um, my understanding, Representative, is that the in order for a referendum, a constitutional referendum question to be placed on the ballot, it must be passed at least. 180 days before the date of that election. So the election would be November 2020. This would be roughly six months before then. So we are um, almost a year in advance or perhaps 11 months in advance of the actual deadline for moving this forward, correct? Yes. Now, are you aware of any of the other 48 constitutional amendments that have been uh, filed uh, this legislative session? Are any of those amendments yet to move forward? Have any of those amendments been released from the House Rules Committee or the Senate Committee on Assignments? I am not aware of that. None of the amendments have been released. Maybe that's because they're premature. Maybe that's because they're ideas uh, that don't meet uh, the support of the majority party. Um, Representative, it was mentioned the uh, issue of rate setting. Is it your intention that rates would be approved by the legislator and submitted to voters in advance of consideration of this amendment? So the, the, uh, there are rates um, that have been filed. There was a hearing on them uh, in committee and um, I, be I I believe that the intention is that those rates, uh, that there will potentially be a vote on that before we adjourn. And if rates are established by the legislature, if voters approve this constitutional amendment, what guarantees will be in place to those voters that the rates established in this legislative session would be the effective rates going forward after passage of the amendment? So Representative, um, the those would be the exact same protections that are there today. Um, since the passage of our income tax in 19, or institution of our inst income tax in 1970, if memory serves me, there have been roughly four increases in our tax, um, in our flat tax. There have been two decreases in our flat tax. So the flat tax has had very little movement over the course of the 40 years that it has been in effect. Is exactly the point of why the unified tax structure is so important, because it acts as a very powerful disincentive to a continued adjustments and manipulation of tax rates to feed the whims of the General Assembly and the appetite for spending, the lack of fiscal discipline that your opening comments emphasized uh, that have been such a problem for our state. One more question. Will this amendment allow for the establishment of additional types of income taxes, whether they are supplementary income taxes passed by the legislature or local income taxes uh, implemented by home rule units of government? Uh, I, I, I don't believe so. I think what you're referencing is the fact that when they created the language, and in fact, I have the minutes of the Constitutional Convention when, when this was done, there was a language that was put into the amendment that limited it to one tax. There shall only be one tax, and this removes that. That language, if you read the actual comments from the convention, was done to prevent uh, a backdoor uh, uh, graduated rate structure. So this is literally what needs to be done legally to permit a graduated rate structure, but it is really no different than it is today by simply declaring other types of income as taxable income, we could bring those in. So it really wouldn't change anything on that front. 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, to the bill. This amendment opens the door to really limitless spending here in the state of Illinois. And I'm uh, really thinking about Memorial Day today as many of our families are traveling outside of the state of Illinois. They're traveling to visit their family members who have left us because the state of Illinois leads the nation in population loss. And why is that? Is it just our weather? Uh, no. Every state around us is increasing with jobs and population gains, and they're doing well because they have made a decision to invest in economic growth and create a business climate that is favorable for job creation. This is a blank check for poor spending. This is giving more power to the very most powerful in our state. I strongly urge it. Chair recognizes Representative Wheeler. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm just going to go to the resolution, and I want to talk about Illinois taxpayers and job creators because Illinois taxpayers and job creators should be very nervous about what's happening in the body here today. I asked in committee about the language of this amendment and how it maintains the same 8 to 5 ratio between individual and corporate rates, and under this new proposal, that remains. So I, I asked that because I want to understand what parameters to be placed on, on this approach. So I asked the questions about maybe limiting the number of brackets there could be. How many different rates could we charge Illinois taxpayers? Is there, should be a cap? Should be a cap on the, on the highest rate Illinois taxpayers pay in their income? I think that'd be a reasonable thing to ask if we're actually going to do something strange here and actually protect taxpayers. There's not even a cap or on the ratio between the highest and the lowest rates. That would be an appropriate protection for only taxpayers. In fact, there's not even a requirement that the top income earners pay the highest rate. That's not in here. Under this constitutional amendment, this General Assembly could actually find out what the highest earning Illinois taxpayer is this year, set a bracket for that level of income, and set a specifically, truly confiscatory rate well into double digits for that one person. Because we aren't protecting any taxpayers in what's being presented today. And like we've said for years in this body, how about property tax reform? One of the things we know drives Illinois taxpayers to other states. Is there a cap in here? Is there any kind of relief, any reform whatsoever? Is there even a, a real approach we could take? We could consider setting a rate like 1% like Indiana does on the home values, but that's not here either. There is no taxpayer protection in this constitutional amendment. Taxpayers should be concerned. What this does do is open the door. It opens the door to rate changes that could occur any time this body chooses to do that. I know that my friend, the sponsor, does not want to discuss that part of it. I think that it's real. We've seen it happen before, ladies and gentlemen, when there was a flat tax and it's supposed to be harder to raise taxes, the lame ducks did it in 2011. And it was a heck of a tax increase. We went from 3% to 5% retroactively. You think that can't happen on a certain set of brackets in the future? Don't kid yourself. When it comes to compliance, understand the wealthy are the most able to move and they're the most able to create tax shelters to hide their income. New Jersey, New York have all seen this before and had to deal with this in a hard way. We're aiming for the same problems that they already have shown. And I always, always talk about small business when we talk about something this big and this important on the floor. It was mentioned that a stable state government would be an important thing for taxpayers who are also small business owners. I agree, that's, it's a part of it. What's really important to them is stable income tax rates. So they can invest and plan for their business, their future accordingly. We are taking those protections away with this constitutional amendment today. Job creators need to know that there are no protections in this constitutional amendment for them. We talk about fair versus unfair. And said this is a regressive tax we have right now. It's on the backs of the most vulnerable. That's because our property taxes are taken into account. Again, no measures for protection against property taxes. Nothing. 
not a thing in this bill. I agree with the sponsor's statement that we have a problem with the ability to manage finances. This bill also does nothing to address that unless you consider spending more money, like most people can't do in their actual lives, a way to actually manage finances. We are taking the wrong turn. We're taking the wrong turn because it's not fair to Illinois taxpayers to change what they pay until Illinois government shows they can actually manage the finances that we already have. Our neighboring states are going opposite directions of what we're doing today. And it's a, it's a false choice that there's only two choices here, flat or graduated. There are lots of reforms we could take. This is gonna hurt Illinois business, it's gonna hurt Illinois taxpayers. Please vote no. Chair recognizes Representative Bourne. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. To the amendment, changing our Constitution to allow for a graduated income tax system will inevitably bring a tax increase on a majority of Illinoisans. And I say that not because I'm being hypothetical, but because we've seen that happen in other states. In 17 of the 34 states that have a graduated income tax structure, their top bracket is at or below $60,000 a year. Illinoisans cannot afford another income tax increase, and we cannot afford a system that allows politicians to play with rates and brackets just to fill our annual budget holes. Our current tax structure, which hits everyone in this state equally, is one of the very last competitive advantages we have in our tax code. It also has inherent taxpayer protections because when this body makes a decision to raise the income tax, it has to think about every single Illinoisan and we are not able to carve out certain groups. In fact, many states are learning that these taxpayer protections are important and they are moving away from their graduated income tax structure, including Mississippi, which is phasing out their brackets, and North Dakota, who's phasing out their brackets. What's been missing from this debate, and we've talked about the overall tax structure a few times in this debate already, is we're not talking about the overall tax burden. A recent study showed that Illinois already has the very highest tax burden in the nation, and as you all know, the second highest property tax burden in the nation. In order to be more competitive, changing our income tax structure to be a graduated one, which will include yet another tax increase, is not the right direction, and it will make us less competitive. On top of what the impact of a graduated income tax will be for many families, many small businesses, including agribusinesses and small farms that I represent, file taxes as individuals or pass through entities. A graduated income tax will raise their taxes even farther. We aren't talking about the most wealthy in our society. We are talking about the mom and pop shops who are the small employers in the rural communities in our state who are already struggling to stay in this state and to stay competitive. This will make this, our state less competitive. And for agribusinesses, it's a lot more difficult for them to up and move out of the state. We know what this will do on the Constitution. But what we don't know is what rates will be implemented. And what rates will be implemented are not at all necessarily the ones that we're going to see in this General Assembly. We've already seen many rate proposals. And what we've seen in the trend is rates continue to be adjusted higher just in the last few months, and the thresholds continue to be adjusted lower to hit more people. And that will be the trend that continues because there simply aren't enough rich people in this state to pay for the insatiable appetite of spending that we see here in Springfield and to pay for the structural spending problems that we have. So while the other side of the aisle and this General Assembly and the governor continue to push these policies that increase spending and say that the answer for it is higher taxes and changing our tax system, we know this will eventually hit a majority of Illinoisans. This is nothing more 
than an attempt to raise income taxes. It will make us less competitive. It will drive out small businesses. This is taking our state in the wrong direction. Please vote no. Chair organizes Representative Butler. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, to the resolution, um, 50 years ago this December, in this very chamber, the 1969 Constitutional Convention convened. And what came out of that Constitution was a rewrite, rewrite of a 100-year-old Constitution that was badly outdated. But one of the th things that the Constitutional Convention delegates got right, among many in our current Constitution, is having Illinois set at a flat tax. I would argue that a flat tax is the fairest of all taxes. It impacts everyone equally. You know, for quite a long time, since that 1969, 1970 convention, the Democrats have controlled either one or both of the chambers of this of, the, of the legislative branch of government. 44 out of the 50 years since our last Constitutional Convention, Democrats have co controlled one or both chambers. I believe for the past 16 years, Democrats have controlled both chambers. And what we have seen is what we continue to see in the state of Illinois, driving people out of this state for economic opportunity in other states of this nation. We should be a powerhouse. We're centrally located in the United States. We should take economic advantage of our infrastructure that we have here in the state of Illinois. The great people that we have from across this entire state, from Chicago to Cairo. But no, what we do is institute time and time and time and time again policies that drive people from this state. This is yet another one of them. This is not the answer to creating an economic climate in the state to bring jobs back to Illinois, to bring more citizens back to my district who are losing jobs when factories close. If we spend as much time creating an economic climate in this state and being attractive to business as we do on spending money and putting up barriers and creating more bureaucracy for people. If we spend as much time doing the good things economically that we should, things would turn around in the state of Illinois. But we have seen it, as I said, 44 out of the last 50 years, Democrats have controlled one or both of these chambers. And what have we seen? People continue to go from out of the state of Illinois. If we want to change the Constitution, if we want to change the Constitution, Mr. Martwick, let's change the Constitution. Let's have a constitutional convention. I've got a resolution from the last General Assembly that did that. Because we have a lot of things, not just we, the citizens of Illinois have a lot of things that they would like to see change in our Constitution. Members of the General Assembly who represent a cross-section of Illinois geography and Illinois politics have sought to amend the Illinois Constitution to address challenges including taxes and revenue, term limits and recall of elected officials, voting in elections, home rule governance, unfunded mandates, education funding, public pension reform, consolidation of constitutional officers, and legislative redistricting, among other things. That's what I included in my resolution last year. We've got a whole laundry list of things. Representative Spain talked about all the constitutional amendments that have been bottled up without a hearing. If we want to have a serious conversation about where we're going to go in this state, let's have this discussion. But let's not have this one-off amendment that's going to change the tax code and continue to drive people out of Illinois. This is not the right way, and I urge a no vote. To recognize is Representative Miller.
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. To the bill. <clears throat> One of the things that uh, when I was listening to uh, Representative Markowitz's comments, so eloquent comments to begin, I thought, I normally wear a pair of cowboy boots to work every day, but I thought I got the wrong equipment. I need a pair of gum boots for this stock. One thing that I do that I've done in the past 40 years, I'm a farmer. And what farmers do is they grow things, they solve problems, and they fix things that are broken. And a lot of the problems get solved around the kitchen table. And I know one of the things that I think about when when I think about this bill, I think about what would this look like if we we're having this conversation around my kitchen table. And I know that probably one of the first things that would happen would one of the one of my family members would look at me and said, Dad, have you been drinking this early in the morning? I know one of the things that that we think about how continually we put lipstick on a pig, and in this case we call this a fair tax. And there couldn't be anything more unfair that's ever been brought before this assembly as this. I know one of the things that I've observed over the past 65 years of my life, anytime Democrats talk about making something fair, it's code language for me that everybody is getting ready to get the bohica. And this is just another case of that. This is going to end up eventually being just another tax on the middle class. There are several things, reasons why I oppose this bill. And the first thing is, is it penalizes achievement. I know ever since that I was young and what I was, I was encouraged to work hard, to keep my nose to the grindstone, to get a good job, to build a big house, to work hard to make as much money as I can. And every time we turn around an oppressive government, sits like vultures on a high line ready to take more money out of your pocket. The American dream has become the American nightmare. Number two, it takes three, approximately $3.4 billion from responsible citizens' hands and puts it into the hands of irresponsible bureaucrats. As uh, Representative Butler, Butler noted, uh, you've all been in charge for a long time and look at the results of that. The states without an income tax had a, have a great, greater GDP. They have a greater wage and salary growth per worker. They have a shorter duration of unemployment. You know, when you think about this, from the last stats that I looked at, we have the 18th largest economy in the world, and we have done everything possible to destroy business here in the state of Illinois. The third reason is it will increase the exodus. Hard-working Illinois families have either left and they're thinking about leaving. Current businesses have either left or they're thinking about leaving. I've especially ex had this experience since I live along the Wabash Valley, where it's so easy to move across the, across the river to Indiana and have a better life. And the third thing in the increase of the exodus is there's no bus new businesses in their right mind that are coming. And number four, None of these things fix the problem. The blue model of tax, borrow, and spend has, hasn't worked, it isn't working, and it will never work. It has left a trail of destruction every place it has been tried, from Connecticut to California. And not only would I encourage you to vote no, but I would encourage you to vote hell no. Chair recognizes Representative Calkins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Will the speaker yield? Sponsor indicates that he will yield. Thank you very much. We, uh, you, you, you talked about uh, spending, and I want, to, I want to talk about what we did in the General Services Committee. And I'm very, very proud of the work that we did on a bipartisan way to cut spending, to hold spending down. There is an opportunity, I saw it firsthand, we can control our spending if we put our minds to it. I don't, I, and it, 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 it was, you know, a, a, a very uplifting experience for me. So to say that we've cut everything to the bone and we can't cut anymore doesn't ring true, at least not in the General Services Committee. Secondly, sir, you said that if we didn't do something with this progressive tax, that our tax rate 
would have to be 6.25 percent. Uh, according to COGFA, so I asked COGFA to run a study. I mentioned this in the Revenue Committee. I asked them to basically do a projection uh, between now and 2045, which is the extent of our pension ramp. And I asked them to assume that we made all the payments on our pensions as we should, and we lived up to our commitment to fund education, and that the growth in all other spending stayed at its 20-year historical average, which I point out is quite low in Illinois because of yes. the financial pressures we had. They said that in order to balance our budgets, we need a 6.5% flat tax. 6.5. And if we didn't do something sooner, every year we delayed, that 6.5 would go up. Yes, every because you're running a deficit, Correct. you cause more debts, and you put upward pressure on taxes. And, and when will we see the income if this progressive tax amendment were to pass? 2021. So what happens between now and 2021? Well, I think that's why you're going through the exercises that you're going through in your committees is where we're trying to scrape our way through until we get there. But there is not enough to eliminate the structural deficit, but we can patchwork something that gets us through until that time. So we're able for the next couple of years to make our budget work without this tax increase. It does not, and in, 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 see, Representative, respectfully, it does not eliminate our deficits. We are not able to cut our way out of this. We saw it over the course of the last four years. We had a governor who couldn't propose a budget that got us within $3 billion of a balanced budget. It, it, it didn't happen. And, and members were not willing to vote for those cuts. It, it's the reality of the situation that we're in. It, thank you. And it, it's sad that we're willing, not willing to vote for the cuts, but we are willing to vote to increase our taxes. But we have voted for those cuts year after year. And in fact, when we voted to override the governor in order to uh, pass an increase in the flat tax, the, 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 that budget included a billion dollars of cuts above and beyond what the governor himself proposed. I understand. And, and, but it also concerns me greatly that you talk about structural deficits and spending money, and yet we look at this proposed tax and 200 million out of three some billion only goes towards additional uh, pension funds. And, 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 and that, that's very concerning. As I told you in the committee, if every dime of this proposed tax increase went to pay our bills and to pay our pensions, this might very well be a different discussion. And, and while I appreciate that sentiment, then what I would ask you in converse was, is if every dollar went to pay back our pensions, would you then be okay not living up to our commitment to fund education? We're supposed to be putting $350 million a year so that we fund education properly, we provide a quality education, and provide property tax relief. So it's, it's great to pick out one thing in a silo, but we have to address all of our problems. I understand. To the bill, please. Uh, my fellow members, please make no mistake about this. Uh, this is a jobs tax. We've heard from Illinois manufacturers, we've heard from business leaders, we've heard from small business owners about the devastating effect this tax increase will have on our economy. We, you know, we continue to push tax cuts that will drive even more jobs and more people out of our state. I strongly oppose this attempt to replace the Illinois flat tax with this graduated tax because I know and I believe you know that eventually this tax will get to the middle class and will do exactly the opposite of what you are intending and proposing to do today. We didn't come here. Representative, your five minutes has expired. Can you please make your final comment? You. We didn't come here to draw people or drive people and businesses out. We were elected. We came here. We ran to make this state more competitive, more co job friendly, and to help stabilize our economy. I urge a no vote. Chair recognizes Representative Skillicorn. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Will the sponsor yield? Sponsor indicates they will yield. Hello, Rob, how are you? I'm well, thank you, Representative. Very good. So uh, we, you talked about reforms, and you call this reform. Are you open to discussing other reforms, maybe something like a constitutional amendment for term limits? Well, I, I, I believe that those sorts of measures should be handled separately, and if, if you're 
You know, I, I think that's, if that's an interest of yours, then by all means file it, and we can have that discussion. So you'd be open to having a discussion on that? Well, it's not, it's not a measure that I support, Representative, just as I suspect that this is not a measure that you support. Okay. What about a discussion on a Constitution Amendment for fair maps? Again, uh, it's not my issue. The, my issue is, is this that we have before us. It's the fair tax. This is what I campaigned on seven years ago. It's what I filed bills on. It's what I've had town hall meetings on. It's what I believe in. This is my issue. This is what I'm putting forth. And what about a discussion on a property tax hard cap? Um, I have... Uh, worked tirelessly towards property tax relief. In fact, I passed a bill in the last General Assembly that increased homeowners' exemptions, saved taxpayers in Cook County between $300 and $1,000 a year in property taxes, so I'm always happy to have that discussion. And I would zealously advocate for a property tax hard cap, but to the amendment, here we are debating a constitutional amendment to hike taxes when Wallet Hub says Illinois' tax burden is the highest in the nation. Revenue and tax receipts are off the charts at record highs right now because of President Donald J. Trump's economy and tax cuts. Is this struggle about spending or is this struggle about revenue? Hear me say this. Illinois has a spending problem, not a revenue problem. It's about the liberal trifecta of higher spending, higher taxes, and even more waste. In 2011, this body passed a temporary tax hike with no reforms. In 2017, this body again passed a tax hike, a permanent one, I might add, with no reforms. And now, this body wants to jam through a constitutional tax hike with still no reforms. People of Illinois, people in the gallery, people watching online right now, Chicago politicians want more of your money more money to feed their legislative pay and lucrative pensions. More money to stay in patronage workers. More money to defend, the benefit Chicago public schools over our own suburban school districts. Hear me say this. Illinois has a spending problem, not a revenue problem. We haven't had a meaningful discussion about amendment for fair legislative redistricting. We haven't had a meaningful discussion about an amendment to reform pensions. We haven't heard a meaningful discussion about an amendment for term limits. Three items that pull off the charts. Three items that are very, very popular with all of our constituents from all 118 districts. Hear me say this. Illinois has a spending problem, not a revenue problem. The supporters of this tax hike are politicians, lobbyists and other political parasites, not the hard-working people of Illinois. I've been calling this a jobs tax because that's exactly what it is, a tax on jobs. Ladies and gentlemen of Illinois, our issues are about spending and not revenue. Thank you very much. Chair recognizes Representative McDermott. To the amendment, I really struggle with how we live in some alternate universe here in Illinois, like the universal laws of economics don't apply to us, but yet they do. We're doubling down on failed policies. We're doubling down on taxing our job creators, we're doubling down on taxing our middle class families. We're doubling down on ignoring any attempt whatsoever to address spending. And somehow we think that we're going to have a different outcome, that we're going to be able to address our structural deficit and we're going to be able to grow our economy and create jobs for all the people in all the schools that we talk about all the time here. But yet, none of those things will happen because the fact of the matter is, when you increase taxes on the job creators and on the middle class, which this bill will do, they have no choice 
but to take their businesses and their children to a place where they can prosper because they're not going to be able to get ahead here. I just don't understand why we think that if we keep doing the same thing over and over again, we're going to have a different outcome. The sponsor talked earlier about how our debt service, quote unquote, exploded. Like this was something li like lightning that came from somewhere that had nothing to do with anything we did. Our debt service exploded because we created unsustainable pensions. Pensions that cannot be sustained at any tax level, people. And so if we're not going to address the, one of the largest drivers of our costs here, something that's driving out our ability to support our children and our uh, most um, fragile citizens, then why are we doing this? It's just a futile exercise. And we know that we'll be back in the pockets of taxpayers very quickly. We know, because I heard in revenue less than a week ago, that members of the Democrat Party feel that these rates are not high enough. So people listening at home, I'm going to ask you just like my colleague uh, did to listen to this. Because if you think that this doesn't hit you, you're wrong. None of the drivers that have created the structural deficit have been addressed in any way, shape, or form by this body. And furthermore, even um, the rates that are listed there are not uh, quote unquote enough in the eyes of people that are sitting here today. So the rates that you may see between now and when you vote on this um, amendment are teaser rates, they're fake rates, they're lying rates. And the only way that we'll be able to address our structural deficit in the future is to lower the brackets and to increase the rates because nothing has been done about our spending. In fact, we're adding new programs yet this year. So even in a year where we're talking about having to ask our taxpayers to sacrifice, we're adding more programs instead of uh, using our deficit to pay down um, bills or uh, past due commitments to our pensions. So just get ready because we're going to continue in this horrible, horrible, heartbreaking downward spiral where we continue to, to tax uh, families and business creators out of the state. Please vote no. Please think about how repeating the same foolish tax and spend policies will not change anything about our future. We need to address the underlying drivers and we need to get our financial house in order and this amendment does none of those things.